Welcome to Face to Face. Our guest today is Ian Gillespie. Ian, welcome to our uh, studio. Thank you very much, Upandra. I remember first time I met you, must have been about 22, 23 years ago. You were a senior vice president and broker at Liggett, McCall, Grubb and Ellis. And I was a new reporter at the Boston Business Journal, had no idea about real estate. And we started talking about securitization of real estate, which was new at that time. Boston was in deep recession at the time. So in all these years, you have been an observer of the Boston commercial real estate. How the real estate market has changed in the last 22, 23 years? Well, it's morphed. I was actually at Leg and McCall, Grubb and Ellis, because it was a recession. Mm -hmm. So I had developed um, a number of buildings in a large site prior to going there, but because of the recession, I went back to run that uh, investment brokerage division, which I did for two and a half years. And it was interesting. It did put me back in the flow, and then I went back to doing development. Sure. In some of which we'll you talk helped about me that, with. Sure, yes. I remember yes. 300 Baker. 300 Baker was Conquer, one, yeah. and we did the Muse in Cocker, which was 350 units. We did Addition Hill in Marlboro, mm -hmm. which was 500,000 feet. It's now Boston Scientific. But I think you had asked me to think about this before, and a lot of it has to do with the money. We've mm -hmm. talked about this before. Sure. We were talking about securitization. Sure. Sure. I mean, that has become, at that time, we were not sure what the securitization was. Exactly. And now, not people, you know, it has become a thriving source of financing in commercial. Well, and, and your audience should know that within a month, you became an expert on securitization. Thank you. Sure. You knew more about <laughs> securitization then than anybody. Um, and securitization was really, came out of the crash. Mm -hmm. So we had a crash in 88, 90, everything lost 50% of its value. Mm -hmm. The banks were wiped out mm -hmm. because their loans were 75% loan to value. Yeah. So suddenly all the loans were- Yeah, I remember all these you know, savings and loans. You know, well, uh, not just yeah. savings and loans, Bank of New England. Yeah, sure, absolutely. You know, Old Stone Bank, sure. who was my partner, sure. went down. So, tremendous collapse, and yet, let's say the properties were still worth 50% of what they had been worth, mm -hmm. but now the regulators were saying they were worth nothing. Mm -hmm. So Wall Street says, no, they're worth something. And securitization came out of really Wall Street coming into the real estate business in a way that they had never been there before. And Goldman Sachs became the biggest equity player in the commercial real estate markets mm -hmm. in the early 90s. And securitization was a way for them to bring in the public. The other way they did that was uh, through the public REITs, public and private REITs. So the REITs in 1990, I think there were maybe... A handful of them. Well, there were more. There were like, I think it was 100, 120 public REITs in 1990. By today, there are 220, sure. something like that. The value of the REIT market today is give or take $3 trillion, uh, two trillion of which is publicly traded and a trillion of which is private. private. So, and if my numbers are wrong, I hope nobody sure. will, but this is what NAREIT says, this is what the researchers say. So the public, the, the public and private in markets in the REITs were another form of securitization. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right? Yeah. The CMBS market typically did debt, and these typically did equity, but they're just another way sure. of securitization. Sure. And so that was Wall Street turning commercial real estate into a commodity that they were used to. Sure. And also the money became more liquid. It did. Because before that it was you know, transferring money from one country to another country. So it really became, a, real estate became, at the, I started to become at that time more liquid Come on, sir. Well, you're exactly right. It's funny you should mention that. The uh, became very treaty 
oriented. Sure. sure. Uh, and the Canadians had a great treaty uh, for investment in American REITs. And the Dutch said, I want that same treaty the Canadians have. So all the Dutch pension funds started to come into American REITs. Sure. And they became so, one of the biggest investors. They were, I think they yes. still are, right? Or? I haven't followed it as closely, but certainly in Boston, people thought the Japanese were big. The Dutch were bigger than the Japanese. Yeah, yeah. The only people bigger were the Brits. Sure. Um, but so, it did. Uh, now, I want to bring back to you. So let's stay with the financing sure. aspect yes. of real estate. So in the last 20 years, say, let's, so we talked about securitization. What are the other things you have seen in the real estate finance world today? Well, it's a good question. The, it used to be big families. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the Rockefellers. Mm -hmm. And then it became the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. You know, we have Hancock, Prudential Tower, and so forth. And then it became Wall Street, the public companies. And today, I think we're seeing a tremendous increase. We kind of have a bifurcation. We have the smaller projects which are done by the sort of more nimble entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and those are done with family offices or high net worth firms um, and funds the aggregators of capital um, who put together a 600 million dollar fund or something mm -hmm. jonathan davis mm -hmm. is in that category um, and we worked with greenfield uh, gene gorab had a 600 million dollar fund uh, there are many of these so those aggregators will fund the entrepreneur and then we will sell to the institutional markets. Mm -hmm. So with 300 Baker, actually the aggregator at the time was Lehman Brothers, mm -hmm. was our partner on 300 Baker. Mm -hmm. A distinction that most people won't follow, it was in the days when it was on their balance sheet. Mm -hmm. This was not Lehman having raised a big fund, it was actually their own money. Mm -hmm that they put with us in 300 Baker. Mm -hmm. And then we sold that to MetLife. And I think that's still pretty much the mm -hmm. standard. What about, uh, also let's talk a little bit about the players too. Mm. Our, before we come to the players, uh, one more thing I want to touch base with you is, say in, in the early 90s or mid 90s, uh, how much a developer who really wanted to start a career in, in, in development or investment, how much basic money on hand they needed and how that amount has changed in today's words. If you can just give us some sort of rough numbers. Well, anytime somebody comes to me and says, how do I get to be a developer? How much money do I have to have? I just say, you don't have to have any money. Mm -hmm. All you have to have is a good idea and make a property sit still. If you can see the beauty in a property, particularly a property where you're uh, doing something to it, making it something else. There are lots of people who will give you money for that. Mm -hmm. Again, Jonathan Davis. Sure, sure. Right? Go to Jonathan and say, hey, I need some money. Um, so it's not money driven. It is driven by knowledge of the markets. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I think that makes it very uh, helpful to people. If you and, want you know, to do you it. mentioned Jonathan Davis, I think he has done absolutely amazing in uh, not only in Boston but you know over the East Coast. He right. has uh, picked up right properties and uh, uh, now uh, what about some other key developers in Boston? I think you know you have Seaport, which at that time nobody wanted to go. I remember in in early '90s in in, in that area. Now this has become the hottest area in in, in town. Well, it has. The seaport, I'm not sure I can tell the stories on camera about the true stories of the seaport district. Mm -hmm. Well, you can. Let me give you some fun facts. Yeah. A couple of guys make a deal with a restaurateur mm -hmm. uh, for the fan peers. Mm -hmm. The restaurateur decides that he is not going to grant them the permission that he was supposed to grant them. And they sue him and they win a major lawsuit. Uh, he appeals, they appeal for fraud. So what happens in the fan beer, and there's some very interesting history there that we can write someday, uh, is that Pritzker winds up with uh, two of the peers, 
uh, Antony Athanas is allowed to keep Pure Four, even though there was a $120 million judgment. And the federal courthouse suddenly appears. The Joe Moakley courthouse yeah, I remember appears. That, sure. Right. So, I remember when they were digging the hole there. I, right. Sure. Well, the, the hole to be dug is before that. Mm -hmm. To go back and pull the covers off that whole transaction that went through in, in probably five, six, seven years is a fascinating story. Ultimately, Joe Fallon went in with Mass Mutual, mm -hmm. and Joe really stuck to it. And he had some tough, tough times. He had to do deals with his major multifamily project there, was done on a Massport ground lease. Very difficult project to pull off. Joe did a fabulous job of making the seaport really lively, absolutely. as did uh, as did Fidelity. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. East Towers, West Towers. And well, Fidelity was there with the World Trade Center sure, yeah. going back to the late seaport 70s, yes, early, sure. early sure. 80s. And uh, it was supposed to be Boscom. It was supposed to be the world's computer market. And John Drew, too. He was and John there. Drew came in it. and made that what it is today. John Drew did the, quote, World Trade Center sure, piece yeah. of that. It yeah. was supposed to be something else. And they did a save. Sure. And then Ned Johnson continued with that. But they were an island mm -hmm. for a yeah, long time. Yeah, exactly. I and then that. Fallon filled in, and then Skanska came, and lots of other people filled in. Yeah. So that's another totally new area which has mm -hmm. come up. In the, also, uh, at that time, I remember, I just want to revisit the history here. Uh, 28th Street, uh, 28 State Street was, you know, was a story in itself. So yes, it was. Going around. Now it is standing there, you know, very stable building and, uh, you know, a lot of excitement there. So how the, the landscape of downtown Boston had changed in terms of tenants or ownership? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, you mentioned 28th State Street. I think what you're referring to is the structure turned out to be sure. very flimsy. Sure. Um, as we built these new buildings, the big buildings, they learned a lot about how they <laughs> were able to stand up. The Hancock building has a train car of lead on top of it. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of that? I uh, know I'm not. I it's not. called a tune uh, uh, mass something. So uh, damper, a tune mass damper. So there's a train car of lead on an oil slick on top of the Hancock building. It must sound like I'm making this up, but it's mm. true. Mm. And it moves. And it compresses the structure of the building. That I'm, I'm, oh, I'm over up now. Right. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. So at any rate, the ownership, uh, we have obviously a lot of institutional ownership. That hasn't really changed that much. I, I'm not a believer in office, as you know. Mm -hmm. I think the office market is a house of cards. Mm -hmm. It's not profitable in the big sense, um, it's very low returns, mm -hmm. it's very risky. Uh, WeWork is a fascinating uh, stage set put on top of an old construct. Mm -hmm. Take an office building and take a piece of it and make it funky. Um, I'm not sure that model is a very strong model. The office model itself is a very weak model. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I also want to, since you were for two and a half years at uh, Liggett McCall and the Glover and Ellis uh, from the brokerage side, and now the technology has changed a lot. It has, you know, the, all the information is available publicly. People can find out anything they want to know True. about rent, vacancy, everything. How do you look at the technology is impacting the brokerage business? And I mean commercial brokerage. Yeah. Well, I think it's impacted all the intermediaries. It, it, it's impacted the, the housing brokers, too. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, I think the commercial brokers, and I think a lot of landlords feel this, charge way too much money for the services they provide. And I know some of them are your clients, sure, so sure, sure. you'll forgive me for that. I think the technology, though, I would go to a broader picture of where what technology has done. We've always, I, I've always been fascinated with the sociology of buildings mm -hmm. or of groups of buildings. And when we look at how technology has changed that sociology, I think that becomes a fascinating story. Mm -hmm. uh, 
There are many component pieces to it. But one of them, let's take 300 Baker as an example. We lease that to very high-tech tenants. And when you went in that cafeteria, there were people from all over the world. And there was a meritocracy in that sociological environment that we typically hadn't seen before. They didn't care what prep school you went to. And that, that part of the technology that made, made mobility so free uh, has translated into the real estate environment deeply. Uh, mobility has become a, a, you know, really important. Absolutely. And that's yeah. WeWork. Sure, sure. Right? WeWork is about mobility within a commercial real estate environment. But that's why the kids want apartments. They don't want to own. Mm -hmm. So, looking at next 10 years, I know it is a, <laughs> a tough question here. But what it's a wonderful how, question. But uh, <laughs> how do you look at um, uh, on commercial real estate in Boston and also multifamily or rental housing markets? Commercial real estate, if we, have, if we have a significant downturn, and unfortunately I have just lived, as you have, uh, through, you know, 1988, everybody got wiped out. Fortunately, I, I, was, I didn't happen to be in that part of my cycle. It didn't matter. Uh, then again, the dot-com crisis. Sure. And then you come along and you have, you know, 2006, 2007, 2008. My God, we had Lehman go under. We had GM fold. So there's been a tremendous awareness, or at least there is for me, that if we have that kind of downturn, these office structures, which are all based on the next fool, the greater fool theory, Mm -hmm. These office structures don't make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You just are dependent upon the Norwegian pension fund to come in and bail you out. Sure. The multifamily is a different, again, sociological construct. In the multifamily, I do believe people are going to want to live in villages. Uh, so they come to the big villages, Boston, but then there are smaller villages. Uh, all around. Uh, Tom Alperin did a good job at New England Executive Park with mm -hmm. the village. Mm -hmm. It's turning that into more of a village. Uh, uh, Brian Coop, did, Boston Properties, did a phenomenal job in joining the Prudential Center with Copley Place. Mm -hmm. A spectacular sure, village. Yeah. I mean, on a big scale, sure, that's a spectacular absolutely. village. So we see the village, you know, the live work being much more important. And again, in that's Natick technology too, driven. Just seen the Natick Natick Mall, Mall sort of, yeah, they absolutely. failed at first. Sure, yeah, I mean, <laughs> then they recovered, but sure. yeah, right, exactly. They went belly up for a while. Sure, sure. And Bucksbaum, I think, almost lost that, or sure. did lose it, I forget. They filed or something in that process. But um, yeah, no, fascinating to see, and I think that is the future. Mm -hmm. The live work, which is technology driven. So mm -hmm. when you ask about technology and the money, mm -hmm. these things all start to blend for the future. And also, you know, I think it's interesting that uh, I should say you dare to say about the office buildings. <laughs> 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 but uh, but interesting thing is that now really people, you know, my, I sometime in the morning I say, you know, I can just work from home. Why of I course. need to go to office? So that's also have some impact, already impacting the office building, so. It's like the newspaper business. Sure, yeah, exactly. exactly. You know, it's very similar in phenomenon. I am, I have been dead wrong about this. Yeah. And my wonderful uh, erstwhile partner, Denny Hall, would be the first to say, you've been wrong for a long time. And I, he's right. Sure. I've been wrong about office for 10 years. Um, but I think, you know, if there is a downturn, it's, it's just a house of cards. And I don't mean to put too much emphasis on that, um, but it is the opposite of a lived work environment. Mm. Uh, now, now, what about just to give a counter uh, thought that is still, for example, uh, there is a lot of demand for life sciences, lab space, and uh, you know, like some technology company like in Google and all their, you know, even Amazon, they're coming up. So they are, they, you know, they keep creating this you know, demand. So how do you counter that argument? The most valuable village mm -hmm. in our environment mm -hmm. is Kendall Square. Sure. 
but that's a village. Right. There, there aren't many people that inhabit a lab building. Mm. It's not a lot of people. Mm. But you're absolutely right. The lab building has to have, you know, very specific, very expensive tenant improvements. But it's interesting if you go up to 2,000, 3,000 feet and look down, they again all want to be with each other. That's why the broad is next to, you know, they're all right, they want to be, of course, the center of the village is MIT. Mm -hmm. But Kendall Square is a live work environment that's the most valuable real estate on the planet. Which is true, absolutely. Yes, you know, yeah. it's unbelievable. Sure, yes, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, and It Pedro. was uh, thank a you pleasure talking much. with you and catching up with the uh, past. And uh, thank you very much for your time. A pleasure.